Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. So something a little bit different this week. Now I know everyone's not interested in tractor content, but this is what I'm doing. I'm having a couple of days off this week to do my own stuff. Well, it's Sunday at the moment, so it depends how I get on. So I'm going to Emily Moore next weekend. Emily Moore um, Motor and Transport Rally, it's called. It's the first time it's been on, I think. So I'm pretty looking forward to getting my tractor finished and back out again, because she hasn't been out for two years, I think now. So this is my Leyland 285 that I use for tractor pulling. Now it's had quite a few modifications to make it suitable for tractor pulling. As you can see, at the moment, it has no engine in it because I took the engine out to do some modifications. So yeah, there's stuff all over at the moment. Yeah, she's got no hydraulics or anything on, no PTO. It's just got a hitch and some wheelie bars. And the engine at the moment is sat on this engine stand. So, well, you might, some of you might have seen part one. I did a part one of the engine rebuild. I have videoed the rest of the engine rebuild, but I don't think I'll have time to edit it from now between next weekend. So I might do that as like a midweek episode. But yeah, this is the engine. So this is the standard engine for that tractor. It's a Leyland 698 engine. And then as you can see, it's got a massive injector pump on it. And then turbo manifold, well, I've, I've made that manifold. And then various other engine modifications. So now, yeah, what I need to do now is put the engine back into the tractor. So that's all ready to go. I've had the radiator on it to make sure the head gasket wasn't leaking water through. So it's been sat with water in it for over a week. And that's all all right. So I filled it with oil and that's ready to go back in. So first job, I'll take all the panels off, the bonnet off, everything, so I can sit the engine back in again. I'll put them all back on, so they weren't all scattered about all over. So they're just, yeah, just temporarily put them back on after I took the engine out. Right, so that's the panels off. That's how I managed to get the engine out just by taking this side panel off and the bonnet off. I thought I took the other side off as well, but all the wires and everything is still connected, so obviously I didn't. It would be a lot easier without the bulkhead on, but to take the bulkhead off, there's a lot of pipes and wires to disconnect, and then the brakes, um, both brakes on either side, as one tractors have independent brakes. Both are hydraulic and the clutch is also hydraulic, so they don't be all that to disconnect and then bleed back up again, which I don't want to do. So I'll try and squeeze it back through the top again, same way it came out. But I'm going to have to alter this front here. I'm going to have to alter this because I've put a harmonic balancer on the engine now. I didn't have that on before, it just had a single pulley by itself. But yeah, I've put this, this was come off another spare engine that had a proper harmonic balancer. So I think I'll have to slice down there and slice that middle out. It should still be strong enough because it's it's pretty thick plate. That's an engine mount, that's an engine mount. And it's also the bottom pivot for the or the back pivot for the axle. I was planning on making some different chassis rails for it and putting a rigid front axle on but I haven't got around to doing it 
because there'd be a lot of weight in them chassis wheels, they're like 25 mil thick. And they've had a lot of holes drilled in them. I don't like how it looks. So I was going to press some separate chassis rails out. But well, that'll be the next addition, I think. And then this will all be to alter anyway. So yeah, I'm not too bothered about cutting the square out. So that's that bit cut out. Yeah, I'm happy there's still plenty of strength there. Because there's all that up there to the engine mount. Um, and then the, there is a big pivot at the front for the axle. So yeah, no, that'll be fine, I think. So we'll take the engine off its engine stand now. And then we'll lift that in. I think Oh, the bother I had with the engine when I took it out is it's the engine is longer than the space between like the bulkhead and the front there. So the engine has to sort of come out at an angle and it'll have to go back in at a similar angle. So yeah, I'll take it off its engine stand and then I'll try and pick it up or somehow rig it so that it's pointing down at the bell housing that I can offer it through there and then lower the front down. There isn't much that holds the engine in. There's these two big bolts here two there and then just one bolt at either side through there. Originally these engines are rubber mounted but they always snap so I've made it rigid into the chassis.
So I got the engine picked up. It was a bit awkward. I got it through that loop there so I can have the engine that way on. Same way as a forklift and I can reach over the front. And I've had to put a ratchet strap around it as well, just to level it out. But I'm thinking if I take the intercooler out as well, then I can, I'm not worried about hitting the top of the intercooler. I can lower it down there and then drive it in, hopefully. Yeah, so I remember the issue that I had now, it was a sump that was catching on there before it would go down through that gap, so the bulkhead is in the way. But now I've cut that slot in there, the sump will actually fit in between that, in between there. But what I'll have to do is just take this, take this side panel off because the alternator is up again, the side panel. If we take that off, then that sump, hopefully, can't see through there. That sump then should fit in that gap, then I can lower the whole thing in and then just go forward with it. Right, it's nearly in. See, that bolt hole needs to line up with there, and the bottom one with there. But it's just not going under that bulkhead now. So it's, but it's sat on, the, sat on the steering joint thing there on the sump. And yeah, and that's not quite going under there. So I think last time when I took it out, I think I had to lift the bulkhead up a little bit. As soon as that goes under there, then we're nearly, we're nearly in then. To lift that bulkhead up, I have to take this floor panel out because this floor panel is also bolted onto the bulkhead. So I have to take all the panels and everything out of there and then take that floor pan out.
right, we're, we're winning now. That's one bolt started. So we're going to put that bolt at the other side in. There's like a spacer plate as well to space it off from the chassis onto the bell housing. So these plates are not standard. I made these. I made some I had to make some bushes to go into the chassis rail to make the hole back down to M20s because there's, originally there's a, like a rubber mount that goes in there, but they always snap off. So yeah, the bolts were snapped in the bell housing, so I had to drill them out to M20 and then put these bigger bolts in with these spaces. We've got the top one started at this side as well. That plate is just not quite going the gap at the moment. It's just the engine is, well, it just wants knocking in, I think. Um, and then these blocks are to go in the front. These are the front engine mounts. They originally would have been rubber mounts as well. So yeah, they're just sitting there like that. So it turns out the reason why them plates are tight is because I've got the uh, clutch pipe stuck. Yeah, you can see there, that's the pipe that goes to the clutch slave cylinder and I've got it stuck in between there. So I'll have to make a new copper pipe, but it's not too much of a problem. I'll knock that back out and then get the pipe out and then put that back in again. Right, that is the engine back in then, it's all bolted in. It's just all to pipe back up now and panels and everything to go back on. Turbo to sit back on. I've got a billet compressor wheel to go in the turbo, so that's to put in. Um, and then, oh yeah, the clutch. The clutch is quite interesting because it's a triple plate centrifugal. So it's, yeah, it takes a bit of setting up and uh, well, it takes quite difficult to put in as well. I think that'll do me for today because it's, Sunday afternoon, well it's Sunday evening now. But yeah, at least the engine's in. It was, that was the trickiest bit. Right, so I'm going to put the fuel system back on now. So that's the fuel filter that I've got for it. Um, it's not an ideal setup. It's not really that well. I don't know if it's big enough or not really, but I've got two inlets and two outlets. That's why it's not a pipe valve from one side to the other. So I think. Yeah, that comes from the lift pump and that goes to the injector pump and then I've got it teed off there for a fuel pressure gauge and then lift pump on the side of the injector pump and then I think that's a return and that is a feed to the lift pump so yeah, I'll get that put on I'll get the turbo sat on and get the oil feed to the turbo piped up and then I think I'm going to run it up without a radiator on It'll be all right running it for 10 minutes or so without radiator and just check my timing, make sure I've got a timing light. So I can put a timing light on it and just double check or right with the timing first before. I, if I put the radiator in, I don't think I'll be able to see in properly. So yeah, I'll get that put back in. That goes in bolts to them, uh, to that bracket. So before I connect the feed up to the pump, I'm just going to put some diesel in it and pump it through the primer on top of the fuel pump, uh, fuel filter, in case there's any muck inside that pipe. We'll get that cleaned through and then we'll put that on. And then there's that pipe as well is for the fuel pressure gauge. I'm 
I've got the pump bred up now, I've got diesel coming out of there, but I've also noticed we've got diesel coming out of there, which is not good. So, I'll have to take this clamp off, and then I'll have to take that cap off and see whether there's a, whether the O-ring is leaking. Yeah, you can see on that um, cap that the O-ring is damaged, that's why it was leaking. So hopefully that'll be an easy fix, just put a new O-ring on. So under these caps is a delivery valve and a spring. So I've modified these, I've drilled a hole through them. They originally they had a little like valve in there that I think is supposed to dampen the shockwave in the injector pipe once the injector is closed but some of these don't have them in anyway so obviously they're not that important so I've drilled them out and they're a lot bigger and I've also altered the delivery valves so that's like your spring and then that thing that pushes the delivery valve in holds it in yeah so that is the delivery valve that is what you call a full cut delivery valve. Usually on there, there's a bit of a collar and it restricts how much diesel comes through when the delivery valve opens. But I machined them off, made them into full cuts and it flows a lot more fuel now. I'm just quickly off to the post office to send some merch out and then I've got to go and look at another job, a repair job on a potato harvester. So that'll take me an hour or two, or an hour. Got a new O ring to go on there. That's on there now. So just need to put this spring back in and then put that back on, tighten it back down. Delivery valve is already in. I pumped a bit of diesel through to get any muck out in case any muck's dropped in. So that's good to go back together. That's the fuel side all sorted now, all the pipes are on. Should be no air in the pump anymore. Uh, there'll just be the pipes to bleed through. So yeah, we'll tidy them up later. We'll put some cable ties around them. But for now, that's sorted. So what I want to do now is sit the turbo on, but I also have a, a billet compressor wheel to go in the turbo. So this is a turbo that I've been using. I bought this brand new a couple of years ago. It's a HX40, so it's not massive, but it's Seems to suit the engine really well. But you can see the old compressor wheel is a bit chewed up. She's sucked quite a bit of dust and crap through it. So I've got this billet compressor wheel to go in. To change that wheel, I think I'm gonna sit the turbo on the manifold and just put a couple of bolts through the wrong way around. Well, but I'll put the turbo on the wrong way around and I can get to this big circlip because these big circlips are a nightmare to get out. If I do it on the bench, I might end up dropping it on the floor or yeah, I don't want to damage it. So if I put it, see it on the manifold, just bolt it on temporarily and then I'm not worried about the turbo getting damaged.
this. See, inside of that looks like it's been sandblasted. And compressor wheel. It's not, not too bad, there's a bit of damage to it. Yeah, they're the left hand thread, I think. So, it's righty loosey instead of righty tighty. How nice that is. Right, so I managed to get that circuit back in. It's real difficult to get back in again. The, the tabs are sort of bent in over, so you can't really grab hold of it very well with, uh, well, with the pliers or the mole grips because it just slips off. And I didn't have any circuit pliers big enough to reach from there to there while it's while it's uh, out. Anyway, with the help from my dad, I managed to get it closed up, get the circuit pliers in and popped it back in. So that's back how it should be now, it's back lined up with the mark. So, yeah, I'll take the turbo off now, turn it around and put it back on how it should, how it should be. So I've got the turbo on now, and I've got a copper gasket between the manifold and the turbo, and I've got this little exhaust on. The other exhaust is on the bonnet, so then when you shut the bonnet, it goes over the top of that, so you don't have to take the exhaust off every time you open the bonnet. And then I put this side panel on just to stop this bulkhead wobbling about. And then I've just made this little pointer to go on there for the timing, so hopefully that should be able to see where my timing is. Like I say, I've got a timing light, like what you use on a petrol. Um, it's a thing that clamps onto the injector pipe and it senses when it's injecting and then it sets the flash off on the gun. But I'm just, I'll get it running first, make sure it runs, make sure we've got oil pressure. And then uh, I'll set the timing light up and see what we're timed up at. So it's all, all the battery lead and everything's on. It's all wired up how it should be, it's just, Obviously the turbo's not piped up yet, so that's the inlet. Check the pump. Well, I checked it before it was before I put it back on again. 
the rack is not stuck. Sometimes these pumps, if they haven't been run for a long time, the rack can stick. But when they do stick, they stick flat out. So if you don't check and you start them up, they're, they're just rev straight to flat out. But yeah, I think we should be good to go. Engine's got oil in it. Everything's clear, nothing's in the way. Um, yeah, I'll just have to bleed it through first, I think. I do have an exhaust extractor up in the roof there that goes down onto the exhaust, but you can't really see what's happening to start with. So I'll leave that off until I get it running and then I'll put that on. And I've also got a big fan up there to suck all the smoke out. If it is timed up somewhere around what it should be at 28 degrees, it probably won't start without ether because you know, the timing is so far advanced and the low compression pistons. But anyway, we'll see what happens. It always makes me a little bit nervous starting them up for the first time. It's like I've got a black eye. I haven't. Um, yeah, it always makes me nervous starting them up for the first time. Not necessarily because I've had it in bits, just because they're a bit unpre unpredictable. Right, we're starting to get some diesel through now, so I think I'll give it a bit of ether. I've got some filters for my mask as well, so they should stop the smoke, I'm hoping. Right, so it was running, but it was only running on ether. So I think we're gonna have to, you know, it'll be a two man operation. I'll have to get my dad to give me a hand. And one of us will either, we'll have to keep it running on ether and the other one will have to check the timing. But I've run out of battery power now, so I've got a battery on charge. This battery that I'm using is the old one off my forklift, so it's not very good. Um, well, yeah, I'll have to leave that to charge up for a bit. Then we'll have another go. Well, the battery's on charge, um, I've just been drawing this, I might have one of these to make, so I've just been getting all the measurements off that and drawing that up. So like a pipe shoot off the back, back of a drainage trencher. So I think I'm about ready to have another go at running it. So I've got that on there, this little box, it takes like the pulse off the injector pipe, you know, like converts it into a signal and then you, you clamp on your normal like, timing light onto the handle on that. Then that should give you a pulse on your timing light. A shine onto the onto the gauge on there against that pointer, and that should hopefully tell me whereabouts number one cylinder is firing. Looking 
Right, so I was having a bit of bother with this um, box. We weren't really getting a consistent reading with the light. And you can see, just by moving the wires about, it's making the light go on and off. So it was just too inconsistent. So, yeah, I sort of lost where I was. I sort of retarded the timing a bit. But then we were getting oily stuff out of the exhaust, which usually means you're too near top dead centre. So, yeah, I, I took the delivery valve out again and just spill timed it with that bit of pipe so you can see well, I'll set the camera up I can pump on the lift pump on top of the filter and then when the spill part is open diesel like fires out of there and I keep turning the engine round and just as it's starting to, just as it stopped coming out of there and I can see on my mark now that I'm 26 degrees before top dead centre so that should be good at that. So I'll just go back a bit with the engine and show you, you'll be able to see diesel firing out of there. You can see that it's just stopped, it's just down to a tiny drip. And then I'm at 26 degrees. So yeah, that should be good. I was in for 28, but if I need to I can advance it a bit more when I get when I'm at the show, when I'm trying to pull in. See how it goes at 26. So yeah, happy with the engine now. Runs timed up. So yeah, put the radiator back in, intercooler back in, all the intercooler pipe work, then we'll put this side panel back on, then we'll put the bonnet on, and then uh, that's the front bit finished, now we've got to get the clutch put in, and uh, yeah, sort the clutch out. Right, so that's all the panels back on, the bonnet back on, intercooler in, radiator in, all the pipe work back on. So, yeah, I can't do much more of that at the moment. I don't want to put the panels on yet because it might be a bit of fine tuning to do, a bit of tinkering. The stopper cable still to go on, but I've just ordered a new one of them because the old one had seized up. So, yeah, I'll get the clutch sorted now and I can start putting the clutch back in. Right, so this is the clutch that I'm using. So this is a triple plate centrifugal clutch. So there's three drive plates, three drive plates, and then there's two intermediate plates. So you so have one of them, then one of them, then another one of them, then that one, and then the last one, and then this cover over the top of it. 
So this cover sits on these adjustable stands, which also locate onto them intermediate plates. So it transfers the drive to the gearbox or whatever through six of them. The way these work is you put weights on these levers here. That's, that's an old lever. I've just made some new ones from this morning. That's an old one. It's got one off on the end. But the way these work is that's your pivot there. And then them two are the ones you put your weights on. And then as they're spinning round, the centrifugal force forces them out like that, which then puts all the pressure on this heel. And then this heel presses onto the bottom plate and then nips it all together. So as it spins round, they fly out like that. And then you can alter how much weight you want for how much, well, if you're, if you're revving, if you're a high revving tractor, you don't want as many weights on. If you're low revving tractor, you want more weights on. Um, yeah, the tech a bit is setting up, but I think we should be right with them weights on. <clears throat> so the idea with these is it sort of loads your gearbox up gradually, and you can run more power through them as well. But you sort of, well, these, work sort of opposite way to a normal clutch so your pedal is in theory down all the time and then as you rev it up it pushes a pedal pushes a clutch pedal back up at you so when you're on the start line ready to set off you keep revving your tractor more and more and more till so you can't hold the clutch pedal down anymore and then when you can't hold the clutch pedal down anymore you, that's when your sort of tractor sets off so yeah we've got to get this lot back into the tractor now and that is where the clutch goes so it's good that it's an open bell housing because you can take the clutch in and out without having to take the engine out or split the tractor in half like you do with some tractors. But yeah, it's just difficult getting it in and getting it lined up, especially when there's three drive plates, two intermediate plates, and then that big heavy cover as well. And that's the input shaft that I use. I made this one because I kept snapping and twisting the, like the standard JCB input shafts. Uh, JCB used Leyland for some of their skid units and they put a bigger input shaft in. But yeah, this is what I'm using now. So this is a inch and three quarter ten spline shaft and then I've adapted it onto this coupler. And then, yeah, that bolts between that and the bit on the gearbox. Then I made that round it as well in case that shaft snaps. It, it, the shaft doesn't start flailing about so that's to sort of catch it if anything happens this bit goes inside of there and then that's your bearing i think i made that uh, like housing for that bearing as well and there's a cross shaft that goes across to to push that bearing in and out uh, i think i did make a stand actually that goes on the trolley jack so i can bolt that onto a stand and put all the clutch bits in wheel it underneath wheel it underneath and then jack it up but then it is still tricky getting it into the bearing getting the input shaft into the bearing because there isn't any room to reach in to do it
Right, so that is the input shaft into the bearing now. That's the hardest part. And I've got one bolt in and then I've got whatever, like a, a bolt with a head cut off. You can't see through at the bottom to act like a dowel. So that's in. So yeah, all the weight of the clutch now is on the flywheel and on the shaft. So that is a clutch all in now, torqued up, all the bolts are torqued up, couplers on, that's tightened up. See that's spinning nice and freely. Hopefully there's enough slack in there for when it gets hot that it doesn't bind up. It's like a mil and a half of, of slack. Hopefully that should be enough. So yeah, I put this cross shaft in now that works the bearing. And then I need to get a new pipe made because I squashed it when I put the engine back in. Right, so I haven't recorded so much because I'm just trying to get on and get it done, but <clears throat> I've got the clutch in and that's all rigged up now. So I've got a new pipe from the master cylinder, it goes down there to the slave cylinder, which is there. And then, yeah, so that works now. It hits up again that stop, just as the bearing pushes up again the fingers. Like I say, it works opposite way around to a normal clutch. So. Yeah, these fly out. Um, but yeah, that's all. I've got all the box back on around the bell housing. Like bell housing protection in case anything explodes. Which it shouldn't do because everything's steel. It's a steel flywheel and all the clutch is steel. The bonnet. I've got a kill flap on here. So if anything goes wrong, you just pull a cable and it pulls a pin out and then that's spring loaded and shuts your air off. That's like a safety feature you've got to have. What I'm doing at the moment is I'm just making a cable. I've got that cable there, which which I can pull from sat on the seat, but you've got to have one that goes to the back as well. So if either your chain breaks that holds you onto the sledge, or if anything goes wrong, the sledge operator can stop you as well. So I've just plasmed this little bracket out. So that will go onto that old cable like that. And then I'll thread that new cable through there and then I'll just loop it over that, loop it over there and then that'll go around to the back of the tractor at the back. So that's that. Yes, yeah, so that'll come to here somewhere. I'll have to make a little bracket to go on there. There's still the inner cable to go in yet. Um, yes, yeah, so and then that connects to the sledge. So I've got a switch to mount onto the gear lever there somewhere so that it won't start in gear. So when that presses, switch is pressed in, you know, the tractor's in neutral and then it'll only start when the tractor's in neutral. It's another safety thing you've got to have. I'm going to record them jobs because I just want to get them done out of the way. And then there'll be all the side panels to go back on. And then hopefully we should be good then. I haven't had it running up to temperature yet. So I want to get it running up to temperature, but then Need to get it done today because we're loading it onto the wagon tomorrow to go tomorrow. Right, so I think I've got everything done now. So I've got a switch on the gear linkage. So when it's in gear, the switch is out and you can't start. And when it's in neutral, push the switch in and you can start it up. So that's that done. That runs through a relay. And then I didn't know how much draw the exciter wire takes for the start motor. So I thought if I put it through a relay, then we're not going to burn the switch out. I mean, my wiring's not great, but I'm not a, not a big fan of wiring. 
So then I've got the fan on a relay as well. It wasn't on a relay before, and it kept melting the connection, so I put it on a relay. That just wants fastening up in there somewhere. And then I've got my cable done. I just need to get a longer inner for that cable because the inner was too short. But that bracket goes on there. Yeah, that little bracket I cut out bolts onto there and that one bolts through that. So I just need to loop a cable around that back on itself. And that cable goes down underneath the floor. And then made a little bracket to go on the back there. To stop it pulling the cable out all the way, you just you put a cable tie on the end and then it snaps the cable tie rather than pulls the whole of the inner cable out. But yeah, I think that's it. So this here is water methanol injection. There's one nozzle. You could do with some more nozzles really, but I've only got one in at the moment. Injects water methanol into the inlet pipe. It goes to the engine. Help cool the charge cool down a bit. It's got an intercooler as well with a fan on the intercooler, which helps a lot. And then on my dash, all this lot wants a good clean off. It's been in shed for two years or so. So I've got oil pressure. That one is fuel pressure. And then I've got boost pressure. And then on here I've got EGTs, rev counter and engine temperature. And I've got a, a light that comes on when it's injecting water methanol and a charge light. And I've altered all this, Just put a little steel wheel on. Everything that's red oxide is stuff that I've made. Oh yeah, I think before I put the side panels on, I'm gonna get it running, get it up to temperature, make sure we're all all right. And if everything's good, then we'll put the panels on and then maybe give it a wash off. Right, so that's her uh, with all the panels back on. So, yeah, I ran it up, got it up to temperature near enough. And, yeah, everything seems good. A few little oil leaks, but nothing I'm too concerned about. It's mainly on the, on, like, the side panel on the engine that's leaking. But it's only a dribble, so I'm not really concerned about that. So, yeah, I think he's coming with a wagon tonight to load it up. It's Thursday night now, so... I think I'll take it out, give it a bit of a wash before he comes. Well, I think he's coming tonight, either that or in the morning. But yeah, I'll take it out and give it a wash off. <laughs> 